I'm doing great. How are you doing? Not too bad, yeah. Had a bit of a boozy one yesterday, so just sort of recovering. Adam boy. Yeah, it's entertaining the uh the time difference. It's uh it's 4 p.m. here on Saturday, so I got beer in hand. You're you're 8 a.m. You you back home in Melbourne? I am, yes. I uh, 8 a.m. Sunday morning. So we had a bit of a actually it was an engagement party. So um not mine. Mm-hmm. Um my wife's brother. So it was nice. Yeah. Good to be home. Good to be yeah. catching up with everyone. Yeah, no kidding. How long how long you been back in back in Oz? Two weeks. Two weeks yesterday, actually. Um yeah. this time two weeks ago, we're waking up going. We're home, you know. It's, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a journey, really. Like the whole build up with COVID, and then actually, you know, shutting the life down, and yeah, it did feel nice to be land in Australia and land home. Yeah. Is uh, apologies for not knowing the answer to this. What's the indefinite future? Is is Australia home? Or are you going to be jumping back and forth between Europe and? Down under? Um, at this stage, Australia's home. Like, I think we're definitely going to be living here. That was the whole idea. Um, just to sort of, I felt like we'd run our course in Europe as a, as a family. And, um, you yeah, know, I was ready to come back and just sort of settle in and, you know, have a house of my own and actually do work on it and see family. So that sort of thing's for sure. But in terms of me personally, I don't know if I'll go back and forth a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, It'll just depend, I guess, on really what I do. I'm still going to be writing a little bit next year. So um, a little bit, you know, a little bit like every sort of retired guy, a bit alternate, <laughs> um, you know. Uh-huh. It's, just, it's a dream really, you know, because maybe you felt the same thing that you're sort of done with racing and you sort of feel like you've, you've suffered enough on that side of things. But I still love writing. And I was like, well, how can I get paid to do this, you know? Yeah. So, um, Let's let's do it. Yeah, that's sort of the the perfect jump on question. I mean, so for one, congratulations. I mean, I know having been through it, retirement's not an easy decision. Sometimes it's forced on you. Like if you, you know, if you find yourself injured late into a contract year and then all of a sudden it's it's November, December and you're struggling, and then you know, you see those headlines, so and so hangs it up at the end of the year. So, you know, from my perspective, it looks like you definitely could have continued racing. Um, looking through your social media, it was, it was entertaining. It was exactly 26 weeks ago, exactly a half a year ago that you retired with that great announcement that said three teams, three mullets, all good things must come to an end. So the question is, yeah, how, why, when did you make that decision to hang it up at the end of this year? I think it started brewing. Like I've, I've said this a few times, it starts brewing early on in your career. Um, and you sort of retire. 10 times before you really do retire. You know, you have a bad race, you have a bad period, and you throw that out there in the wind. I'm just going to pack it in, you know. Mm -hmm. But then last year, the COVID year, I sort of committed a heap, like a lot of guys in that that build-up to come back to the August period. Like, I mean, train the house down, train with Woodsy every day. So we all know that he's Mike Woods (laughs) as a bloody trainaholic. So if you train with him every day, you're really going for it. Yeah. And, um, I came back and I didn't really make much of a dent in the Peloton. I was just like another number. And I was just like, what the hell? Like, I seriously like really twisted a nut to come back. I was like, this is the time I'm going to go to Strata Bianchi and just like go top 10, you know, like all these sort of things. Like years before, it's not like you don't have that, but you always know your place. And this time I was like, all right. And I guess the writing was a bit on the wall there. I was like, okay. I did everything I could and that's just what is required now to be in the Peloton. I think I understood that. So I was like, okay, well, I wasn't sucking, but I also wasn't suddenly making steps forward. I went, okay, this is just what is required now. You have to twist a nut to be in the Peloton, you know, mm-hmm. just to be what I normally do. And um, I didn't really want to finish last year on that sort of weird year. I sort of had those thoughts, ah, maybe this is it. I thought, no, I don't. Don't finish that year, go into next year. And if those thoughts are still there, then um, maybe it's right. Um, I went to the the opening weekend uh, earlier this year and realized that I guess I didn't enjoy the sacrifice anymore and, and the, the risk and that sort of stuff. I knew where I needed to be. I knew what I had to do, but I didn't really want to do it anymore. Um, 
so yeah, and then early on there, I was like, okay, again, I was like, oh, I don't, you know, push it away, you know, maybe you get to Roubaix and see if Roubaix will be, you know, make that decision for you. I don't know what I was hoping for there. Go there and ride a good race, and suddenly I'd be like, no, nah, I'm going to push on. But when Roubaix didn't happen, um, I went, what are you waiting for, mate? You know, like let's, the, it's it's obvious. Um, I don't, the sacrifice isn't really worth it for me anymore. Like I said, um, just to sort of keep pushing on and really have anything more to achieve. Sure. Like you said, you, I know I liked it. I loved how you said, yeah, you could have easily kept racing on as you know, you wish that decision was like that, but every time the contract rolls around, it's not always a guarantee. So there was no guarantee I was going to get re-signed, but um, I sort of thought, well, how about I don't even get involved in that game and, take my own sort of um, handle on it and make the decision myself. So Mm -hmm. I was, I guess I was just sort of ready. I I wasn't really looking forward, looking to try and just roll it on for the sake of rolling it on. I I asked myself that question. Is there anything more I really want to achieve? Are you, you know, am I going to have regrets? And, you know, so far I'm, I'm, (laughs) I'm happy with that decision, you know? Yeah. I listen to your podcast. I love your podcast. I see that you did a, one with a whole bunch of recent retirees, which I think is such a cool way to sort of glean knowledge from folks. Um, anyway, a lot that you just said there, I do want to touch on. Um, I think I think there's a unique perspective that goes from every nationality to the world tour. So, you know, a Belgian's experience is going to be much different than an Italian's is different than a Spaniard's, certainly different than an American's, very different than an Australian's. So you know, this is sort of an educational question for our audience as much as anything. I'm curious, I'm curious your entry into cycling being an Australian, like where did you find it? Uh, Were you doing other sports? Um, You know, did you take to it immediately and think, yeah, this is exactly what I want to do or, or, you know, were you looking at the the historical figures in Australian cycling? What's it like being an Australian trying to get into cycling? I think it's changed now. Um, And definitely when I started up, the guys who did it before me, and I'm sure it's the same with Americans too. There was a completely different road um, and the road which progressively gets easier, but maybe harder in different ways. Um, you know, just to give you an example, if you did make it to Europe, um, especially sort of before me, um, you were sort of destined to be professional. That was the step. If you made it there, you were good enough to go there. Whereas I feel like now you actually going there isn't that hard, but actually turning professional sort of is. So that's the sort of slight differences. And I was sort of in that middle scope where there were a few guys who could go there that still didn't make it, but sort of maybe a more bigger percentage that went to Europe turned pro because guys just weren't taking that risk. They weren't, wasn't as easy then to make that path. And when you say, Um, when you're saying make it to Europe, you're talking like to be selected by a national team to go race for Australia. Exactly. Yeah. So to be the selective with the national team to go um, was, is one way. I didn't necessarily, I didn't do it that way. Um, I went across and sort of hopped around in some, I was racing as in a Swiss team. And then I raced on the UCI, um, the UCI under 23 team. Um, and then sort of made my way that way doing a little bit of national stuff. Um, but to go back before that in Australia, um, I was playing, yeah, I was playing all different sports. I was playing rugby and cricket. Cricket's pretty big here. Um, and it was actually the Olympic Games that got me involved, 2000 Olympics here in in Sydney. And we went to it and I discovered truck cycling, um, or velodrome racing. So that is something I raced that right up until I, before, until I turned professional. And I think that's just a really beautiful sort of breeding ground for good cyclists not necessarily for the power side of things, but for the race craft, um, which again is something that I think is getting lost along the way these days. Um, and that was something that I did there, sort of transition across into road. And um, like I said, you know, was able to jump across to Europe and make it that way, which, yeah, like I said, it, it is a different pathway now, but I, I do think weirdly, yeah, there's something, like I said, exactly. Some things are much easier, but then I guess some things are much harder. These guys are teams are taking a lot of, I wouldn't say risk, but a lot of guys who are giving them an opportunity who have got the power, but maybe don't have the racecraft and just hoping that they will turn, you know, into these 
beautiful stars, but it's not often happening. And actually their opportunity is, is over before they even got a chance in a way. Whereas if I think if they'd taken a, a step back, learned the race craft, then they would be racing for 10 years as a pro opposed to getting a chance for two years, burning them, their sort of their match and they're sort of done, you know, their name scarred. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I think you're, you're, you, there are a lot of similarities. I think for anybody who's going to travel across an ocean to get to Europe, uh, I'm, I, you know, you and I are of a similar generation and it was the same sort of thing. It's like, if you got to the national team level and they're inviting you to, to Europe, it's almost a, a, there's no guarantees, but you got an open pathway to the world tour. Mm. Whereas now I can't even imagine how cutthroat it has become. And you got like all the more talent. It's, it's you know, rising tide has made everybody that much better. And then I feel like it's almost a more restrictive barrier to entry to get into the world tour. Um, anyway, great, great perspective, great response. Um, switching gears into a, a pretty <laughs> entirely different direction. While I was in the pro peloton, I was unmarried. I didn't have any kids. Um, I feel like I feel like that's about equal. You know, you have the young guys who, who aren't married, don't have kids. And then, you know, there's an older generation that, that is moving on with their lives and, and that may or may not affect the way they race. What has your experience been? Because I think you've had that, that arc within your time in the pro pelt mm. to become married, to become a kid. Did it change the way you race or perceive racing or training or, or how's that all been? Yeah, on well, training side of things for sure. Um, yeah. It just becomes a bit more, you become a bit more efficient. Um, you don't, you, know, you don't fuck around, excuse the language. You know, you don't, you don't muck around. You get out there, you get it done. You still enjoy doing it. Um, but there's a bit of a purpose about it. You know, I've got this time. I'm going to leave it this time. I'm going to get back. You, you just sort of, one, there's that responsibility to help out and, and do what needs to be done around the house. But also, too, you're sort of like, I want to be back home. Um, I want to be around the family. I want to hang out with my son and my daughter. And yeah. um, so there is that, that definitely changed the the training side of things. And you probably, a lot of guys didn't really enjoy training with me at the end of the day. Um, Cause it was just like, when you clip in, let's go pedal hard, um, you know, quick, quick brew stop and then pedal hard home and at yeah. some ridiculous hour. So like Woodsy, Woodsy was a good training guy for that. Cause we could go toe to toe, but um when it comes to racing, I think for me, um, yeah, you, they talk about this, the best season of your life after you get married. Um, I had heard that. And I was recently reading back through some old diaries of my year after I got married. And on paper, I don't know if that was my best season. And it's difficult to know what your best season is as a, a type of rider, maybe like you and I, where... You know, you can't quantify it by actual race wins. But, you know, I read back through, through some of those notes and I certainly was the most happiest, I think, in that next year. Um, you know, just really enjoying it and really actually being quite um, aggressive and, and knowing what I wanted out of what I in, went into races and, and striving for more, you know. Um, I think having my wife, she's my, you know, my most loyal and biggest fan, you know, just that support and being married. And I think, you know, I, I understand that people don't believe in marriage too. And that's not a massive thing for us that we, you know, we have to get married and everything, but we really wanted to get married just to show this commitment to each other. And I really valued what she was sort of sacrificing for me over there. And that, that commitment meant like, okay, we're on this road together. Let's do it. And let's, let's keep moving forward. And we made these plans about our life. And that's also something really funny that I'm, I'm a bit, a big believer in sort of goal setting and um, around cycling for sure. But I've, I've recently read some stuff that I set some 10 year goals and I put them away in, in diaries and things like that. And recently I've been rummaging through old stuff, you know, because mm-hmm. of us moving. And I pulled these 10 year plans out or five year plans. And it's so weird how much stuff has sort of just slotted into those exact years it's right up until the, you know, this year I retired. And as I told you before, it wasn't really planned like with the COVID and, and everything that's happened, it sort of just fell into place. And yeah. I don't know, subconsciously, maybe I was planning it, but I, I completely forgot about that. I said in 2023, uh, 2022, I want to be back in Australia 
and uh, some road, something like that, back in Australia, moving <laughs> on with my life um, in my family house. Yeah. And, I, and then I pulled this up and I'm like, that's so weird that that happens. So, um, yeah, it, it just changes your perspective on, on racing, but not necessarily in a bad way. Definitely towards the end, I did think a lot about the risk stuff when I knew I was going to stop. It was good and bad announcing it so early. Um, good because I could really enjoy some things about my last season, but bad because I knew it was my last season. And you really do calculate all those risks. And you're thinking, why? What for? I'm not racing next year. What am I doing that for? And if you're racing like that, it became a hell of a lot harder. Um, so a long, long-winded answer to your question. But yeah, it's, it, they're all different dynamics that really... Um, change things. It's not just about you anymore, I guess, is the whole principle out of it. Mm-hmm. And when you're tr- striving to be professional and when you first become profess- professional, it sort of has to be only about you because if you're trying to carry someone else along on that road with you, it's just too cutthroat and you need to be just a bit of a bastard actually mm-hmm. and just be like, I need to do this now. I don't care about anyone else. I'm doing that. I'm going to altitude. I'm not eating or whatever the hell you're doing. Just be like a hermit. But then as you sort of move along in life, I think as a pro, I certainly needed the extra stuff to keep me there and more motivated. My, I needed that support network. Um, and the family was, was that for me. Mm-hmm. Where, where did you meet your now wife in the spectrum of your career? Like, were you on Green Edge then, Skill Shimano prior to that? Yeah, it was, it was before that. So we met at university. Um, just out of school I went to university there and we met and then just as I graduated was when I turned professional it sort of really worked out well um but then we sort of didn't get married after we met we didn't get married for 10 years um because we met when we were really young when I was like 19 um and then yeah just we just sort of life was just happening we're going to Europe and we're moving in there there was just so much stuff going on that um in my mind, there was, there was never a doubt we weren't going to get married, but I guess my wife didn't know the way I was thinking. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> left her hanging there for a long time. Yeah. Well, yeah, like to live the pro life is to be forever with the tunnel vision on, you know, like you got the blinders, you're ignoring everything else. Like you said, you're paying attention to diet to, okay, time to go to a training camp. And then they, inevitably it's incredibly selfish. You Ooh. think you're doing everything right. It's got to be so strange from the perspective of a spouse, but hats off to, to you and her and the whole fam. Um, how about similar topic to the, to the geopolitics of cycling? Um, so Girona, Spain is this melting pot for f- professional cycling now. I got there first in 2009, and I remember talking to Dave and Saskia, Bike Breaks Girona, and we did a little back of the napkin poll. And we, we counted about 30 pro cyclists, male, female, across all divisions. And then my final year was 2015, and we did some calculations, and it was about 100. I think that number has probably gone north of there now. What's your, when did you first land in Girona? Uh, you know, was it an a integral part of your career? Is it, is it a place that you hold fondly? Or, or like, where is Girona on your cycling map? Yeah. Um... Well, I think at that point when I landed, I, I went there in 2012 when I changed to Green Edge. Um, and the first three years of my career, I was with the Dutch team, Skill Shimano, as you know. And I look upon those years really fondly now. Uh, at the time, I didn't. You know, it, was, it was a tough sort of upbringing through cycling. But ultimately, that set me up, I think, for a long career because I sort of I had to work out if I loved the sport or not. And that came back to also where I lived. Um, I lived in the north of Holland, or not right up in the north, sort of in the middle, just across on the border of Germany there. Um, You know, right around the corner from a DS in a small little town um, on my own. And then I sort of shifted down to the south of Belgium um, with one teammate, lived in this town there and did two more years down there. So in the end, I loved it because it was just really all about cycling and my friends were all cyclists. But I understood that my wife was starting to live with me then and, you know, she wasn't really loving it. And I was thinking, well, you know, I can probably find people I love about cycling anywhere I go. As long as she sort of feels happy too, that's a big part of it. So 
we looked at, and look, in those days too with School Shimano, there wasn't an option to live anywhere else other than a place that you could drive to race it. So mm-hmm. my options to move anywhere were within a sort of couple hundred range of the service course, which is in Holland. But once I joined uh, the World Tour, I was I had the opportunity to move anywhere. And um, we looked at Luca and we looked at Girona, um, not really knowing anything of the two, um, and drove down to Girona, Actually, just speaking with Greg Henderson, I had some contact with him um, and his wife, Katie. Um, and sort of we knew them from Australia and just said, what do you think? Should we come to Girona? And they, that was, you know, seeing of it really highly. And we thought, okay, let's just do it. Drove all our stuff down there and moved there. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a big part of making our lifestyle, I guess, a bit easier. Um, people there we could hang out with. We heard we had I, the main reason we moved there was for friend, friends, you know, others, other yeah. cyclists that were English speakers. And I knew, well, I saw it so much. I thought that the training and everything would be okay. And actually at the end of the day, like I said, I thought I can train good pretty much anywhere. You know what it's like, you know, unless you live in Qatar, I think you're pretty, <laughs> pretty, you're going to be pretty okay. Great example. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and, we sort of found our way there, but, you know, along the way, I also realized as great as Girona was, exactly as you said, it was becoming this place where just so many people were flooding into. And I really did feel like I needed an escape. Um, and that was, we actually moved to Andorra then. Um, and so we sort of lived between both um, Andorra and Girona. And that was the best of both worlds. You know, I didn't feel like I wanted to live the whole time in Andorra. Um, but then also it was nice to come back to Girona and then in Girona, sometimes it was like, I need to get out of the bubble and we go back to Andorra. So, um, that was the way we did it. And, you know, I know a lot of, a few other guys are doing it like that now too. And I just think it's sort of the best of both worlds. It was just a bit too much of a pressure cooker sometimes in Girona. Um, but it is a, it is a bloody good place. Mm-hmm. And it is, it is exactly what you said. It's amping up mainly with more of the cyclo tourists now and yeah. the young guys. And that comes back to what we said right at the start of the podcast. You know, I feel like you almost need to earn your stripes or, you know, earn your position to go and live in Girona. That's the way I sort of thought, whereas I feel like a lot of guys now are living there as amateurs, as, you know, even before that and living a pro lifestyle before they've even become professional. So yeah, I've got a whole other conversation on that another time. But, you know, that's just, I think it's not the correct way to do it. But, you know, whatever. You know, that's just the, the, the way things are changing, I guess. Yeah. Um, picking parts of your response there into the next question. So maybe or maybe not you remember this. I think you and I first met, we were overlapping at an altitude camp in San Moritz. So I think you were there with a teammate or two on Skull Shimano. I was there with Cervelo Test Team. We overlapped, did some bike ride, and probably said g'day, and that's about it. Um, I raced for another six years from then. You've raced for another, what, 11 years since then. In my time over those next six years, I don't think I necessarily saw the Peloton picking up speed. Um, I think, I think the general consensus was that that era of cyclists were really trying to clean up our reputation. So I think it was a much cleaner Peloton. If the increases of speed could be attributed to anything, it was, it was the team sky. It was focusing on the, 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 the marginalization, you know, like where can you find every little marginal gain? Uh, Focusing on the wind tunnel, you know, using non-compliant sponsor equipment for the sake of being faster. So the question is sort of taking a big step back. I feel like there is, I hear rumors of a changing tide in the pro Peloton over the past short period of time, like Mm. how, you know, the death of the group the cutthroat nature of UCI points. Am I hearing correct rumors? Are these things happening or, or is this just sort of mumbo jumbo talk? No, I think it, like go back to exactly what I said when I came in last year and there's been a massive shift from August last year. Yeah, that's pretty much been the biggest shift of anything. The racing started with with Strata Bianchi. I was there in that race, and it was just like this epic race it was hot, whatever. And everyone sort of attributed to it was just the first race back. 
And then the second race was the same. And then the tour was crazy. And then the Giro was epic. And then everything, blah, blah, blah. And then everyone just went, okay, maybe it was just this crazy bit of racing mm-hmm. rather than just this one race. It just had to be this crazy period. But then we started, then we started this year and I wasn't in every French race, but I did Hood Var, which is, you know, it's a smaller race and it's a hard race. Yeah. And I remember doing it in school Shimano and finding it really hard. And I thought, oh, you know, that was whatever it was, you know, 12 years ago. It shouldn't be too bad now. And it was so hard. I, I on the last day I got dropped 4K into the race. I rode the stage out because I was like, well, I've got nothing else to do. And um, we looked at the data. And, you know, not the data is anything to go off, but I was just like, I need to compare this to something. Is this really hard or am I just like unfit? You know, what the hell's going on here? Yeah. And everyone, and you would remember it, that one of the gold standard races in the season is Paris Nice as a, oh, as a bit of a like, you know. Hate that race. Yeah. Exactly. You either, it's a love hate. You either have won it or been on the podium or you hate it. <laughs> exactly. It's just like, it's just a tough, hard race. And it's anything you can compare anything to. And especially the last stage races around Nice there. Um, and so in this, this hood fast stage, we did a race very similar stage to the last stage of Paris Nice. Mm-hmm. So we could really compare the data and the data, the, the actual watts for that last day were much higher in this hood fast race. Like Whoa. I'm not crazy. This is really hard racing. And so what I'm trying to say is that the level of racing just has stepped up and it hasn't gone down. Everyone has just had to look. I think the introduction of the three sort of immortals, we call them, you know, um, Van Art, Van der Poel, and, you know, um, Alaphilippe. These guys, everyone's gone, okay, these guys are setting the new level and they were just like so much above everyone. But mm-hmm. slowly, everyone's just lifting to that level now. Um, it's just, it's, I really just did notice this shift from last year that just hasn't changed. And that's just the level of racing now. People are understanding that's what you have to do to win. Mm-hmm. And it's, I guess, why would it ever drop back? Do you know what I mean? Everyone's just pushing the, pushing the ceiling more and understanding they don't have to be scared about trying crazy things, you know, attacking 70K from home solo. You can yeah. do it. People are doing that. And so I guess the, the ceiling's being pushed. It's making the racing more exciting. And the training, like you said, is speaking like, I know myself, but as you evolve with it, you don't really notice the change. Like, you know, every year you're doing more. And so it's just natural for you to do that. Whereas when you look back on stuff and you think, oh, oh, hang on a second here. If you want to go right back to school Shimano days, you know, there was no real training after the training camp. You just raced from race to race. And I didn't even have a power meter and blah, blah, blah. Okay, that was old time ago. But even in green edge time, you know, it just wasn't as specific as that. But, you know, with our team, we're doing less racing. And we're just, when we go to the races, you have to be ready to fire. So you're learning how to train ready to race. Lots mm-hmm. more motor pacing, a lot more specific efforts that when you get to the race, there is no warm up period. You've got to hit that race going. Um, and it's just, the, it's just the way it is now, you know. And I think it's, it's not wrong what you said. It's correct. It's 100% correct. The peloton is, is sped up. Everyone's level has just had to rise. I don't think that there's more freaks or better talented riders. I think everyone's just understood that we can push more, we can train smarter, or we can, you know, work harder at the one percenters. And mm-hmm. the whole peloton's moved in the same way. Otherwise, you just get dropped. So you you got no other choice. It's it's nuts. Uh, I remember talking to. to... Dombrowski about it and Ian Boswell lives I don't know 50 miles up the road here and he was talking with uh Larry Warbass about how everybody's spending their own money to go into the wind tunnel like that's unheard of six years ago yeah. uh it was it was commonplace for the big budget teams to go in there but now to for every rider to maximize their JRA just riding along position it's it's crazy. So you, you hit it in a phrase. You said you don't think it's going to regress. Like, what's your crystal ball say? Do you, is it like, is, is there a plateau? Is there a point that we cannot get any more marginal gains from maximizing our training or what the heck is going to happen? I think 
I predict that the race craft has got to come back. And I really, I really am harping on about this lately is that something I've really noticed is that if we go back to what I said before, the, the Peloton is looking for the next most talented guy. And you think about the juniors coming through now, that's all they know. They train with power meters from the, the day they start. And, you know, they've got to, they, they're so aware, they're much more aware of all that stuff than I am, you know, come in and, but how many watts per kilo can you do up this climb and whatever? And you're like, I've got no idea. You know, I just ride up the hill as hard as fast as I can. Yeah. They understand all that world. But what they don't understand as well is the racing, I don't think. Um, and like I've said a few times is that the reason why I turned professional was because I won a race or because I did well in a race. It wasn't because of my data. No one even knew what I could do. There was no power meters then. So that was sort of irrelevant. And it didn't matter if you push, you know, average of 200 watts or an average of 400 watts. If you won the race, you won the race. I know that's still important now, but I feel like on the edges of the guys who are sort of coming in or the guys who are doing jobs, sometimes their job can be sort of saved. If they don't do a great job, but if they've got good data, then that's okay. Because he, something else must have gone wrong because his data said that he was good. So, you know, it doesn't matter really if, you know, he mucked up there or he didn't achieve what we wanted. He had good data, so he'll be good eventually. And they overlook the fact that maybe this guy doesn't really know how to race properly yet. Maybe he's burning so much energy on the side of the bunch instead of riding through the middle of the bunch or whatever it is. So I do think that it's going to get to this point where everyone is just like, like you said, they've ex ex exceeded all the little one percenters. The bikes can't go any faster. You can't train any harder. So you're just going to have to race smarter. Mm -hmm. And it's going to come back to guys learning how to race, race a lot more as juniors, get back on the track, whatever it is, to really become the, the smartest guy out there again. Um, yeah. And I'm not saying look, I'm generalizing too. You know, this is just a general sort of thing. And this, I'm sure there's a lot of guys coming through. Um, you know, a really, good, a really good example was on EF was Logan Owen. Um, he... Look, I don't know his data exactly, but maybe he wasn't the most talented rider in the bunch. But what he could do on the bike, he came into the peloton because of his way he came through juniors, through BMX, through cyclocross. Um, he came into the bunch, you know, after the first year and he knew how to move around. I always remember we raced in um, two down under the first criterium, whatever they call that, the cancer classic race. Yep. And he was moving through the bunch. He was carving it up, everyone. Everyone yep. was like, who's this guy, this Neo pro, you know? He had no fear about doing it. And I remember talking to him like, hey, Logan, you got to chill out, mate, because you are already making a name for yourself. And he said, yeah, but I was just following Sargon. Sargon's doing it, Peter Sargon. And I was like, it's crazy that you could just do that. You know, you could just follow this, this crazy guy because he had the skill, he had the race craft. So yeah. in my crystal ball, I think, that's going to become one of the most important elements because once you sort of maximize your own physical ability and your bike can't go any faster, the only next thing is to, to race smarter. Mm -hmm. Man, that takes my mind in a million directions. Uh, being teammates with Sagan and trying to cart him around the peloton was always entertaining because yeah, you like work your tail off to move him up the entire bunch. You need to do that. And that takes five minutes or you just watch him like move from back to the front. Like it's nothing. And yeah, he's got the reputation that, you know, that people are going to let him in anywhere. Um, the cyclocross piece and, and looking for marginal gains. I mean, immediately I think of Heinrich Hausler uh, and it's so freaking cool to see his love for the sport. Now him dropping into world cups and racing cyclocross is, is incredible. And then two names that you mentioned, uh, Ala Philippe and Wout Van Aert. I think they both recently had kids. I'm curious. I'm curious if that's going to change the way they race or, or the longevity of their career. Um, you know, there's also the talk and rumor of, okay, you come into the, the world tour Peloton so hot, so fast. Is that sustainable in the long haul or do they want to do a seven year career and call it quits? And they've probably earned a pretty I, fat check. In yeah, the end I agree with you. I don't think there's going to be um, the 15 U pros anymore i think you know the long the long pros are going to be 10 years now um yeah. even like i think 
this year I retired after 13 years and look, I'm not anyone to sort of hang your hat on, but you know, there was a few other guys that retired this year around the same sort of period that had 13, sort of 13, 14 year length careers, which were considered as old, a long career. Mm-hmm. Whereas just before me was like Matt Heyman, these guys had 18 year long careers or, you know, the, the super long ones were 20 or they were 15 around that and slowly coming back. Mm-hmm. And I feel like in the future, like you said, it's going to be you know, a long career will be seven, eight years. Mm-hmm. Um, short career, two years. <laughs> yeah. um, short career used to be four, four, four or five years. And that's just going to get reduced. And I think the long careers come in hot, earn your money and get out. Yeah. Time will tell. That's the best part about predicting the future. Who the heck knows? Yeah. Um, so your final race was Roubaix. Obviously, very strange set of circumstances being October and being one of the gnarliest, worst weather Roubaix is in recent memory. I haven't heard the exact story, but I have finished two Roubaix in the passenger seat of cars. One was terrific, where it was a grandfather, a father, and son had driven down from Belgium on Easter Sunday. And so there I am, drinking hot chocolate, eating Belgian chocolate in the back of their car. Another one was a group of (laughs) British soccer football hooligans had come down. They were just getting drunk at bar to bar to bar, eating the frites. They loved it. They took me back to Roubaix Velodrome. (laughs) Two terrific examples of how how Roubaix will often finish. This is this is a question. It's to educate our audience, but it's also my own curiosity on how your final race finished. Talk to talk to me. Talk to us about how Roubaix ends for for the folks who are not in the front group. Yeah, the funny thing is with Roubaix <clears throat> is, and I don't know if everyone understands this. It's also a never really a told thing that guys do get dropped, and then guys get so far behind the race that they need to somehow pull out of the race and get to the finish. Um, and in Belgium, when you're typically racing the Belgium classics because we're sort of racing in a cobweb around and looping over each other. And actually the start's only sort of 20 K away from the finish. So you can sort of make your way there. If you know your way around well enough, if you don't, you could be in for a long day anyway, but you can shortcut to the finish. The thing with Roubaix is you're going from point A to point B. So actually almost the fastest way is the route. Um, And because you only race it once a year, you never really learn the roads well enough to go beeline it there. Um, you know, whereas in Belgium, you sort of race, you know, 15 times there a year. So you sort of learn the roads well enough. <clears throat> and in Roubaix, you have to make an educated decision once you get dropped. Because every time you go across the sectors, there's now there's support staff at every sector. You know, when you were racing it five years ago, it was actually only every two or three sectors, but now things are getting more crazy. There's like so many staff at every race. So Mm -hmm. at every sector, there's someone with wheels and a bottle. And um, if you, if you sort of like about two minutes behind the bunch, you can still see your support staff, but if you're sort of three, four, five minutes behind the bunch, that's a, uh, that's a support staff. Sorry. That's a support staff need to go to the next sector. Um, And they got to pack up. They got to move. So once you fall behind, there's actually no one really there for you anymore. Um, so when I say you've got to make that educated decision, once you're sort of just immediately dropped, you need to just make the call, am I going to finish this race or not? Um, if you want to get in with your team car. If you decide to ride on for a bit further, suddenly you're in just the middle of nowhere. There's no support staff. Um, and yeah, actually it sounds like that you've had it a couple of times where you've got to make a decision then, am I going to ride the finish the whole way to the end? on my own slowly getting slower and slower um and actually what happens is the the crowd get a bit more gnarly they care a hell of a lot less because there's no one protecting you so there's guys all over the cobblestones you're weaving through the crowd then therefore you're getting further and further behind um so ultimately you make a decision okay i've got to get a lift here um and in my case I really wanted, I knew this was happening. I could see it all happening in front of my eyes. Less support staff at the end of the bunch and potentially there's a foreign team car there that you might try and flag down. 
And then there's less and less of them. And you're like, okay, I'm riding myself into a bad situation here. I need to either go with the next team car I see, or I'm sort of going to have to ride the whole way to the end. Which um, let's point out that's any team car on any team. Like exactly. those team cars become a taxi service for riders. So it's not like you're purely looking for an EF team car. You're looking no, for no, a- that it's any team car. Yeah. yeah. And that could be just like a team car that's not even they just could have VIPs in it, not like a just a team stickered car. Yep. Um, and the last one I saw was a Sky one um about 15k before Arenberg. And I really, really wanted to get to Arenberg because I had a um, fan club who had gone and spray painted my name like the first, the last 50 meters before the sector. Mitch, 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 Mitch. And I was like, I've got to get to Arenberg. <clears throat> but yeah. this thought in my mind was, as the Sky car was coming towards me, sorry, in your car, I reckon that's the last team car I'll see today. And I was like, do I flag it? I was like, nah. I'm just going to take the risk. I need to go there and I'll just deal with the consequences once I get there. Um, I knew I wasn't going to ride to the finish at that point because I guess everyone's probably thinking, why wouldn't you just ride to the finish? Um, I'd, I'd broken my elbow sort of three weeks before. And by that point, I was just in a bad way. I wasn't enjoying the race. I wasn't comfortable in the sectors. And it was 100K from there till the end. I was already, what, 20 maybe 30 minutes behind the bunch. So I was going to be sort of way behind. So I'd already made that decision. Getting to the end wasn't an option. Um, so anyway, I get, I get to Arenberg and I thought, <clears throat> worst comes to worst, I'll maybe see one of my fan club guys there. And I'll just, I don't know these guys personally at that point. Maybe I'll just jump in there. Um, and Arenberg, maybe there could be someone there. I don't know. It's just the, such a sector. And um, so I hit Arenberg and as I'm riding across there, I saw an Aussie mate who works for um, one of, for our sponsor, Rafa. He'd come across from the UK. Mm -hmm. Hamish is his name. He was standing halfway along Arenberg and he jumped the fence and ran out onto the, like to the edge of the stone. So in front of me, just to cheer me on, go Mitch, go. You know, he'd hung out there like 20 (laughs) minutes after the bunch. Yeah. And I was sort of hobbling along there. I was like, Hey, Mish, take me to the velodrome. Like, as I yelled out, and he's like, yeah, good on you, mate. Yeah, yeah, I'll see you at the end. Like, assuming like I'm just taking the piss. Yeah. And I was like, no, I'm serious. You know? And anyway, I keep riding along, and I was thinking, oh, I don't care. I'm just going to get to the end, flip it, and ride. Like, there's a gravel track that runs next to the cobblestones. Yeah. I'm just going to flip it and go back and find Hamish. That's my ticket. Like, he's got to have a car. And um, as I get to the end... I turn around and there's these two guys there with um, Life in the Peloton caps on, which is my podcast. And I was like, oh, boys. And they were two English guys. They're like, oh, hey, Mitch, hey. You know, I was like, oh, can you guys take me to the velodrome? They're like, oh, yeah, good on you. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no, no, like, seriously, I'm, I'm serious. done. <laughs> I'm done, you know. And uh, so like, yeah, okay, sure. And we ride up to, the, to his car and they're like, oh, actually, we're here with Hamish. I was like, oh, brilliant. And um, so we all pile in this, um, this uh, Range Rover and I was like completely covered in mud. And I was like, what do I do here? Like, just sit down, who cares, you know? And um, one of the guys had actually brought some beer over for me to give me at the velodrome if we'd run into each other. And he brings it out. He goes, look, I've, I brought this beer for you from the UK. Um, you can take it with you. I said, there's no way I'm taking it. Let's crack them open right now. Yeah. So we cracked them open. Um, <laughs> We rode in the car for an hour back to the, to the velodrome. We saw one of our team cars um, driving in because ultimately once you get close to the track, you need to have the, um, the accreditation to get in. We flagged down my team car and I, I jumped in that and, and rode the last bit in. But um, the, the best part about that was, and maybe you experienced this too, it's never nice stopping a race. And especially for me, I had a lot built up being my last race of my career, this whole romantic sort of story in my mind. I wanted to get to the velodrome and finish this way, this certain perfect finish for me. And it wasn't shaping up to be that. Um, But in a weird way, it sort of was the best way I could have finished that race because I got in there and I got a chance to be with people who are a real fan of the sport, who are a real fan of mine. And we got to enjoy this sort of moment of reflection of my day my career 
and that moment and just to have a beer with these guys and just sort of been a nice little moment of reflection. It's over mm-hmm. a, a period of relief. Um, and just away from the team, away from maybe a foreign team car where you potentially would have just spoken about the disappointment or whatever else and been in this whole downward sort of fit, you know, moment, we're able to sort of rejoice and, and, and embrace that moment. Um, I was really thankful for those guys and I hope, I'm pretty sure they enjoyed the moment too. So it was great. It was a great sort of situation that came from nowhere. That's freaking awesome. I mean, outside of winning the race, that's <laughs> you're you can't beat that. That's that's awesome. Um boom. Okay, perfect. Well, <laughs> so I'm a big fan of your podcast. I mentioned that life in the Peloton. Through the podcast over the past couple of years, you've shared your own insights and, and experiences as you're relate as you're relating to and talking to other people who are who are part of the Peloton. Now that you're stepping away from the pro peloton, what's what's retirement looking like? I mean, that was that was a romanticized poetic answer. I mean, question: What's the next phase of the peloton and Mitch Docker? Well, it is what it's sort of I was saying is I'm going to be doing some stuff for EF, um, still riding for EF and Rafa, um, and just sort of exploring, I guess, the peloton outside the world tour. Um, and that's what I would really love to still um, document through life in the Peloton because I still think there's a lot of interesting Pelotons out there. It doesn't necessarily need to be World Tour. And I really do want to touch in with the World Tour to understand what those guys are still going through. So I don't forget that either. Um, but then sort of discover the community around cycling. And that was something I, re- I got a really good chance to do this year when I did this trip Um, in the middle of the year, the length of Sweden, which is Mm -hmm. an event that goes from the very north of Sweden to the very south. And I did it with a couple of employees from POC. And I went there. The original idea of doing this event was Alex Howes and I were going to go there and attempt to break the record and, you know, try and do it in four days. It's 2000 K. And it didn't happen because of COVID and Howes, couldn't get there. And they said, look, I was really keen to do it. I trained for it. And I said, yeah, you can do it with these two guys from POC. And I actually sort of sabotaged their, their holiday, really. They were just doing it off their own back. And suddenly they got this guy going, this, this world tour guy pushing them too fast and all this sort of stuff. And weirdly, I went with this mentality, like I've got to go fast and do it hard and whatever. And then by doing it with these two guys, we set out a timeline of doing it in seven days, stages that were about 300K a day. So it's still long enough to get some fatigue happening, but short enough that we could still enjoy it. Um, And what I understood about that was these events aren't about going there and trying to crush it and not experience it and just be the fastest guy there just because you've got the fastest material coming from a world to a team and you're a pro and whatever. That's nothing against guys who want to go there and break the record, but I think the best thing about this was I got a chance to really meet the community who are doing this and understand why different people are doing these events. And it is for the love of the bike and what they get out of it and what I get out of it. Um, And something that I sort of discovered in my last couple of podcasts, talking to some of these guys who are retiring, that time we get on the bike is our therapy, um, is our time for ourselves, and something that gets taken away from you as a pro. And I guess that's what I've sort of looked for in this next phase is a bit of a wean me off that drug, if that's the right way of saying it, is that we get whatever, if you're a big trainer, 30 hours a week on the bike to yourself and suddenly you go to the next phase of your life and you do nothing. That's a big chunk of your life where you've got a chance to sort of get yourself right psychologically or wrong or whatever, ask yourself those questions out on the bike. And I think maybe I'm going to half time this year um, but still riding, getting that chance to still go out there and have a think about where I want to go or think about the the new situation I'm in. And that's why I really want to document that in some kind of way with life in the Peloton and chat to these people I'm going to meet across the way and in these different events or races or even bunch rides or, you know, adventures that I create. So that's my idea. 
um, I'm sort of looking really forward to it. It's awesome. Well, for one, you're going to love it. <laughs> the byline I used for a while was I went from the world tour to world tourist. Like, yeah, I mean, as long as as long as you leave the sport, the professional side of the sport, enjoying bike riding, you hit it on the head. That was actually one of the questions I thought about, like, is cycling still your therapy? Is it is it something you enjoy doing any day of the week? I remember the first day that it rained and I had in the back of my mind said, well, I'm never going to ride again in the rain. And I went for a bike ride in the rain because I'm like, well, I don't need to do intervals, but it's a, what I feel like riding my bike. And it was rad. Yeah. So yeah, you're going to, in the spectrum of people retiring from the sport and how much they're going to enjoy riding a bike, how little or much I know about you, I think you're going to enjoy it quite a bit. Um, yeah. Yep. Totally. You're going to dig it. All right. So we'll, we'll begin wrapping it up here. Traditionally, I wrap with three traditional questions, but I'm going to give you a, a three questions out of left field. The first one's actually a three-parter, so this is not meant to be confusing. The three pro teams that you raced for are all distinctly different. So the, the first question is, I want you to think of one word that describes each of those teams. Skill Shimano, call it Green Edge and EF. One word for each. Um, necessary for school Shimano. Um, homecoming and That's a good one. Yeah, fun. Fun. You know, like I know it's not a great word, but yeah, fun. I had a lot of fun in the, my last year, my last team. EF, sorry, is the last team. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's perfect, which is funny. It's been really cool to see the, the progression of call it the team EF. Obviously, you know, that team was at one point Cannondale Garmin. That was my final year. And at that point, I would describe the team as fun, but it was a very young team with very few results. And over the next couple of years up through the present, like, holy cow, the success of the team now is mind numbing as compared to six years ago. So it's cool that you attribute the word fun for a team that is now having so much success. So like maybe with fun, you, you, you beget that success. Um, all right, question two. Whether or not you ever do it again, what is your favorite interval? You know what I like doing is the, um, I think I will do it again. I was thinking about it the other day. Is I hated it the first time it was presented to me, the long tempos. Um, you know, like, you know, I, I do three hour ones. Well, I used to do three hour ones, but I think I remember I got, when I first got presented it, getting like a 40 minute or 30 minute long tempo i was like are you kidding me yeah 300 watts for 30 minutes there's no way i'm doing that you know and now like whatever you do but i thought the thing i love about those is you just cover so much ground mm -hmm. and doing a point a point to point ride with a long tempo you're just like oh yeah let's just chew this up yeah, yeah no it's it sort of feels fun to do it in that way because you've set it out as an effort to do whereas if you just said to yourself i'm just going to go fast I don't know, it's sort of never ending and you, it, it becomes too big. But if you go, I'm just going to do go fast for 40 minutes, then it's just like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I enjoy those tempos weirdly. That's rad. Well, yeah, and traditionally, what, they're 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 10 minutes. So, like, to do the yeah. foolishly long ones. I used to, I mean, I'm only bringing it up because you mentioned him. Greg Henderson and I used to call them burrito rides because we'd go out and smash, like, five hours so that you could come home and smash, like, well, we starved ourselves as you do, but just a couple of burritos. <laughs> oh man, that was a, that was a three burrito ride. <laughs> totally. uh, okay. Forgive me if I'm misreading you as a person, but you strike me as the kind of person who's going to a not skip a coffee shop. Like if there, if you're doing a coffee stop ride, you're going to stop at a coffee stop. 
what are the one, two, three things? Like what's your perfect coffee stop? Um, <clears throat> okay. A place that's not full of cyclists. So my own spot that I've sort of found that is, you know, a hidden, hidden little joint, you know, whether it is hidden for everyone or it's just hidden for that moment, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of it's, it's your spot. So it's got to be a place like that. It'd be awesome. You roll up, you know, the guy, so they know you. There's a bit of, you know, Hey, um, and then, you know, a well-made coffee. They understand, you know, the, the uh, good, good machine that's going to brew a, a nice brew, whether that's like a, in the morning, a nice milk coffee or whether it's later in the day, a really nice espresso. Um, and then I think food wise, it's got to have a nice spot in the sun, outdoor seating and I'm never going to get this again, but you know, the Spanish, the Spanish Bocadillo, you know, you, you, yeah. you, you can't get that here in Australia, but I, I think that was so good that just, it's just, just like the baguette omelet inside doesn't cost you a fortune. You know, yeah. I think that option, I want to bring that to life here in Australia. Um, that would be the best option for me. And uh, I'm, I'm, I don't necessarily need anything. Look, I will eat something sweet if it's there, but that's not necessarily the, the must that needs to be there. Right on. Well, if Christian Meyer can bring good coffee to Girona, which when he first did it, I'm like, dude, yeah, right. This is not going to exist. This is the land of your one euro coffee that sucks. And now it's yeah. just changed Girona. You could definitely bring the Bocadillo to Australia. You'd kill it. Exactly. Um, so all right, going full circle. You got the bonus fourth question. What's your favorite beer? Uh, I'll have to say Oval. Oval from Belgium. Yeah. Um, one of the seven Trappist. Beautiful beer. Yeah, I've drunk one too many of those in my time. But look, it's, it's, it's not my... I don't necessarily have to 100% go to it every day. But if there is one available, I'll probably order it nine times out of ten. Perfect. Terrific answer. Well, it's almost 9 a.m. there, so it's nearly beer o'clock on a beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, Mitch, I can't thank you enough. Appreciate taking the time. I issue you another round of congratulations and hopefully see you somewhere out there on a bike. Cheers, mate. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure. Take care, man. Have a great day. Thanks.